John, what happened? <laughs> anyway, so we're here today. I'll start it, Tim. Okay. I'll get us going. Thanks. So this is Reclaim Today, and we are here today with John Stewart, who's the Assistant Director for the Office of Digital Learning at the University of Oklahoma. And John, um, why are we here today with you? What happened? Well, Tim was, I was here in the Reclaim Nerve Center for uh, the Man of One's Own and Beyond. And Tim was reading his feed reader and he moved over to the table. He said, hey, did you see what John Stewart had done? I said, no, I had no idea. He said, it's pretty cool. Come here and look at this. And I said, you know, what is he doing? He's like, well, basically he's blogging at scale with Google Sheets. And I was like, what? And he showed me, we read the post, we looked at it and we were really fascinated by your experiment. So I said to Tim, you know what? Maybe we should ask John to come on a reclaim today and talk a little bit about what he's doing. Um, in particular, John, I'd love to hear about what pushed you to do it, uh, what are you doing, and what are some next steps? Does that make sense, Tim? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, so the general idea is that um, I'm just trying to help a class that has 950 students. This is, I think, the largest class at OU. It's our intro to psychology course, uh, Psych 1113, I think. And um, so this one faculty member has two sections of 475 students each, I think. And, um, and so I went down and talked to her about blogging. And my original thought was that we could set up a, a WordPress multi-site for her. And each of the 950 students would have their own multi-site off of that central hub. And I was talking to Tim. And, uh, and the problem was just that we had basically no budget at all for this project. And so it, it wasn't going to be super expensive to do this. But um, rather than you know try to find money for it, I started looking around at what are some other options to to stand up something like a blog. And I've played with using uh, uh, Google Sheets as a database for, for web projects for a while now. Uh, Martin Hoxie kicked this off. And I think uh, I think both of y'all worked with him and, and with his stuff a little bit. And then Tom Woodward's been playing with you know Google Sheets as a back end for all sorts of WordPress projects for a while now. And so I thought, what if I what if instead of a, a SQL database, there, there's just no SQL database. And I'm just calling everything from Sheets. Um, how would I do that? What would it look like? And so I started playing with it. Um, originally, I thought I would just build a Google form and then collect all the data from uh, a student would go to the Google form, type in their name, a blog post, maybe upload an image. And then, uh, and then all of that would just get saved to a Google Sheet. And then I'd use jQuery to call the Google Sheet and sort of present that blog post. And that was the idea. Cool. And then um, every step of that process turned out to be far more complicated than I anticipated. <laughs> And so I've been blogging a little bit about how I solved each of the problems. But that was the general impetus is how do you get 950 people to be able to blog basically for free? Um, and then how do you, the other problem is I want to make it super sustainable from the faculty member side. I don't want them to have to touch basically anything. And if they do have to touch anything, I want it to be like one or maybe two HTML files that have very little stuff going on in them. So and so I can, I can tell you a little bit about how that works. I read your post and... Uh... One of the questions that was really cool, and it was a cool solution, is you didn't use Google, Google Forms ultimately because you needed to actually allow people to link, include images, et cetera. So you went a step beyond Google Forms, and you basically created your own form. Is that correct? And that's yeah. where people are actually you know, posting and blogging. Yeah. Yeah, so the initial pitch to, to Janelle uh, Cavazos, the professor on this, was it'll be easy. I'll just stand up a Google Form, no problem. Like, she's used Google Forms. This will be easy. And then I go to do it, and Google Forms can't take uh, file uploads. So we can't have any sort of images in our blog posts, which make for you know not very good blog posts. And then the other thing is that Google Forms don't have any way of taking rich text. So if I have a paragraph, you know, a large text input box, it's just going to be text. Um, and so that, that was really limiting. Um, but I found Tom uh, Woodward again turned me on to this one guy who had written some scripts that will handle file uploads. And so I started working with that. And basically, it just um, it, it's a form that's run by Google. Uh, and so you attach this, this form to your Google Sheet and run it as a Google script. And so you upload, uh, you, you create it. It's an HTML form. Uh, the student uploads a file. And then the Google script tells uh, your Google service to store the file in your Google Drive for you. And so it's a fairly straightforward script. And it did everything I wanted. But then I wanted the Google Sheet to record the location of that file. And that's where I had to bring in Hoxie's work to, um, after I'd uh, stored the file, I wanted to, to save all the data to the Google Sheet. 
So Hoxie had some scripts for that, and so I just sort of welded the two together. And um, and that part took a little while, but it's working great now. And then I started figuring out all the little nuances. How do you store rich text in a Google Sheet cell? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is as a JSON string. And so I started using something called Quill.js, which puts together these, it's a rich text editor uh, on the front end, and then exports as a JSON string. And uh, again, just all of these little pieces that, that I thought were just going to work. And uh, I tackled them one by one. Right. And I would imagine, I, I don't know, maybe you can speak to this, that like there's probably a particular use case for this that starts to fall apart as you would need more things like categories and tags and a more robust architecture for building a post. I imagine, you know, like when you're building your own form like this, you know, as a post editor, it's not, you're not going to get like, you know, a lot of people talk about like with the WordPress Gutenberg editor, like you're not going to get anything really amazing. Although a lot of these um, editors that you can embed into sites have gotten fairly decent at sort of mirroring at least what the traditional WordPress editor is like. Yeah, Quill.js, which is what I settled on, looks a lot like the traditional uh, yeah. WordPress editor. And my initial thought was that I don't, um, so Tom's done some stuff where he's taken Google Sheets and then used that to feed WordPress. Mm -hmm. And so again, I thought I would do that at first, but I don't. I didn't think I needed a lot of, of categories and tags and a lot of what WordPress does. Right. And I thought it'd be much more lightweight and maintainable just to have HTML uh, as the front end. Um, mm -hmm. But later on, I decided I did want categories, and so I've gone back and added those in. And so you can do some of those things. Um, it's just it takes a couple extra steps. You'd have to add them in ahead of time, is that right? And then the user would just select them as opposed to the user yeah. being able to add their own. Yeah. Yeah, you could have the users add their own, but they wouldn't be consistent enough. And so right. it turns into yeah, soup. Um, so there's a drop down list now where the students can say I'm I'm submitting assignment number one or two mm -hmm. or three or twelve. And those then can work basically as categories or tags, however you want to think about it. And they end up getting passed as parameters into the HTML. I think one of the coolest, most creative things about this, and really when Tim started talking to me about it over the table, it really sparked my imagination is, you know, the idea that you said, like, we didn't have the money to put up a full blogging platform for this class. Google's doing all the heavy lifting of managing 900 users going there so you know the site won't go down, which yeah. is freaking brilliant, right? And it's kind of like back to this idea of headless web development. Like, you're doing all the stuff through a form that's pushed out to Google Sheets that then is just being pulled into an HTML site. So at the point that Google Sheets maybe doesn't sync or something goes wrong, the HTML is still loading and it's completely responsive and lightweight. I mean, it's a super, super thoughtful, creative solution to a 1,200 person blogging course. Yeah. And I really like when I saw that and you know Tim really laid it out for me, I was like, that is freaking awesome. And it returns to this idea of headless. Like I'm actually kind of like I'm de grooving and digging on the idea that you avoided WordPress for this. Mm -hmm. Like you just basically said, nope, you know, we're gonna go straight to HTML. Yeah, what was your thinking there? The headless piece was really the uh, big selling selling point for me in that um, it I felt like it was more sustainable from one semester to the next. And so at the end of each semester, the professor can go in, uh, just make a copy of the Google Sheet for herself to archive it effectively, and then clear out all of the data in the Google Sheet, and she'll have a fresh set of everything for the next semester. Or she can go in and copy all of the HTML files, and there are only, again, like a handful of HTML files in her OU Create account, and, uh, and tweak a few settings and have that stand up you know, a new setting. And so there's, she can go at it from either direction or both and, and replicate it semester to semester. And so, um, that, that sort of headless feel to it, I felt like would make it very easy for her to copy over uh, from one semester to the next. And, mm -hmm. uh, and when she's training other people, her, her TAs or other instructors to take the stuff, we can replicate it into their OU Create accounts or we can replicate the sheets uh, with a couple of clicks. And so it's feels sustainable. And like you said, it's like even the side benefit of like not only that, but it's also because you're using HTML and jQuery, it's fast, right? Like it's way faster than WordPress can do by doing dynamic database calls and that kind of thing. So it's like you get the side benefit there. I'm wondering, do you get any sense? You know, we talk about like Google scale, but I do wonder, are there any rate limits? Have, have you looked into and because yeah. I mean, you're talking about even still a very large scale depending, I guess, on how many concurrent people are submitting the form at the same time or anything like that? Yeah, it looks like for the form itself, there's a rate limit of 100 forms per 100 seconds. 
Okay. And so if we start getting um, more submissions, you know, more than 100 submissions every 100 seconds, more than one a second, that could be problematic. I don't think that'll be a problem at, you know, even at deadline time, you know, you get an assignment due on Tuesday at night. I doubt all, you know, thousand students are going to submit within a 10 minute window, and they could. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, it could be a problem if she has all of her 450 students in one section submitting something during class right. and to, to do it in waves. So 100 submissions per 100 seconds is one rate limit. The other one that I'm more worried about appears to be 500 file uploads per day. And so gotcha. um, if both yeah. sections have an assignment due and if every student uploads something, we might hit that wall. It's unclear from the way that the quotas are written whether that particular quota applies to this account or not. Yeah. Um, Google's just not very clear on what's a free account and what's a paid account in terms of their tiering. It's it, it, they're not as granular as they actually sort of are. Um, if that makes well, any that was, sense. That was going to be my question because you you talk about paid tiers, uh, paying for Google services, or could you pay for elevated API access yeah. for more calls? That kind yeah. Of thing? So I think their paid accounts, the education and the the enterprise accounts, and a couple of their other paid accounts have much higher limits. And gotcha. I think that's actually what we're on in this case. Mm -hmm. And because the education accounts tend to have higher limits, I think a lot of users who might want to adopt this, uh, you know, might already have those. They might already have yeah. higher limits. Yeah, absolutely. And so those, um, I don't have it in front of me, but I think those are more like a thousand or two thousand file uploads a day. Gotcha. And so that'll wow. that'll take care of our needs. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think the needs of most people. Well, um, again, if you have a smaller, not a smaller class, but if you have a normal sized class of less than 500 students, it's not an issue. I mean, it does really pose a brilliant workaround. And the professor who you're doing this with, Janelle Cavazos, is that right? Am I, yeah. am I saying that right? Um, she seems into it. Like, I think I saw her comment on, on Twitter. So that means like, you know, she's a partner that you're actually able to do this with and say, hey, look, we hit a limit here. We got to figure this out. But I mean, very cool just example of a great partnership for an instructional technology project that solves a lot of problems. One of the things that I was interested in, and I talked with Tim right away, is like, not only is the archive taken care of with different sheets, just I love that. Like, where's my archive? It's a Google sheet. What could be easier? But what does it mean if like students do want to say, take their stuff out of that sheet and import it into a blog? Like, could you imagine writing a script where it's like, hey, your stuff you did, you can import it to whatever space or whatever, or download it as an HTML file. Like, I know I'm always thinking about that stuff, but, and this is early stages, so I'm not saying like, where's that requirement? I'm just wondering, like, are you thinking about making this a fully featured set of options? No, that's a great, that's a great idea. I, someone had asked that on Twitter and I didn't have a good answer, but I think you just answered it for me. It was just, yeah, it'd be, It'd be relatively trivial to go into the sheet and just you know filter for a given student, uh, mm -hmm. copy those entries and paste them into another sheet. But it, it not much harder to actually write a script so that you could have a second form that says you know just fill in the student's name and that'll create an export for you um, if you wanted to you know to have students be able to do it themselves. That's we're um, we're trying to limit access to the sheets themselves even from you know TAs just because we don't want anything getting messed up. But very easy to create a copy of the sheet and then let people do whatever they want to with it. Um, so yeah, I think that's the answer. I think you just yeah you let students export their their cells into another sheet, and then you know I could write a script that would put those into WordPress or you know, do whatever else they want to with them. Um, yeah, and then from a privacy standpoint, I think you talked about how you know while the URL is technically public it's you know it's similar to like a youtube link being unlisted like it, yeah. it, unless people actually know where to go it's not a huge concern and then similarly if somebody was doing a private class i guess you would just password protect the html site where it's rendering right or something along those lines rather than having to do it on a post by post basis yeah yeah if you wanted the, the entire site to be private it wouldn't be that hard um sure. As you said, Janelle's been great about all of this. She um, teaches some workshops for us on using Google in the classroom, and so she's very comfortable with Sheets. Um, she's good with HTML, and so the the initial uh, you know index files that I gave her, she went in and, and made them look a lot better, and so that's been great for me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's been it's the initial you know figuring out the architecture was a bit of a pain, and uh, and teaching myself jQuery was a bit of a pain. But at this point, they, they run themselves pretty well. I'm trying to optimize them a little bit right now as the last step of I'm going from um, copies for each of the different teams of the files 
to just consolidating it into one file and passing variables to to minimize the whole thing. Um, and it's getting it's getting close. I think I can get it down to about three HTML files mm -hmm. uh, for the whole system, um, and less than a megabyte probably for the entire system. So that's awesome. Yeah, and, and it's great to think through not even just in this scenario, but just in general as sort of a Swiss army knife, like in what ways can you use third party services to your benefit while still doing work on your own domain and having that be the, the place of record, but kind of offload some of the more intensive, heavier, you know, processing aspects of it to Google or, or even to other services. You know, I've seen um, classes where they're doing a lot of posting on social media and then pulling it all together at the end as a way to not have to tax WordPress or whatever application you might be running on your domain, have a lot of that content initially live elsewhere and then pull it in remotely. Well, it reminds me too of like, and it, it seems to be of like a genre of folks doing work. And you mentioned Tom Woodward already, like he was working with Michael Wesh on this Anth 101 course. And mm -hmm. They were running that and hosting that with us, but like, you know, WordPress was getting hit by, in that case, like 500 students and it was bringing down the server. And so one of the ways in which they dealt with this is they out offloaded and integrated with the Instagram API. So the site was just basically allowing all the uploading and writing to happen on Instagram and pull it in and frame it on the actual Anth 101 site, which is another group we got to get on and talk mm -hmm. about this because your work is very much in line with that notion of like almost like parasite, not I don't want to call you a parasite, but like <laughs> that idea of like a remora living off the great white, and as they eat, like you can you know <laughs> basically benefit off of their prey yeah. by you know allowing that to scale for nine hundred people, and Google won't feel that at all. Yeah, well, Instagram might be might be really useful for me also if we do hit these file limits of uploads. Maybe right. instead of pushing it into Google Drive, we push it into Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I tying all of these systems together, just their their architectures and, and relying on their APIs. And I think and I think that the tricky balance there will be in terms of that archival aspect. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you put everything on Instagram, then the question is, are you pulling it in later somewhere else if Instagram yeah. were to go away or you lose access to those files and that kind of thing? Versus I can see a more permanent aspect to something where the file is in your Google Drive and you can copy it, move it as you need to, and that kind of thing, or even yeah. with WordPress pulling it in after the fact with RSS or something like that, just so that you have your own copy that exists outside of that third party service. That's right. Like they did that for Tumblr. Like yeah. when we were syndicating in Tumblr, like there was a plugin for WordPress that just copied all the images from Tumblr. So as that Tumblr mm -hmm. went away, like you still had the archive of it, right. which I thought was ideal. Yeah. And if you could do that for Instagram or whatever you would have on Google, I mean, it's, it's, I really like it. It's almost, like I said, it's like piggybacking on these systems. And so another, and huge another courses. Um, another third party service dis, um, discuss for That's commenting. Right. So you're using a third party commenting system, which I actually like. That's um, what my blog uses as well. And I've switched between a few different content management systems. I've been pretty consistent with Ghost in the past couple of years, uh, but I used to be WordPress. And you know, at one point Anchor. I was using one called Anchor. <laughs> and I've, I've used Discuss throughout it all, which is kind of nice because those comments have stuck around regardless of the platform I've been on. Mm -hmm. So I've already been a pretty big advocate of using a third party commenting system as opposed to the one built into the CMS. So it was kind of cool to see um, that you're using it here as well. Yeah, and I've, I've, I'll have to, uh... I'll have to think about how to make the comments more permanent. I was just thinking about when we wiped the data sets at the end of the semester, you might accidentally have multiple blog posts sharing a, a blog ID. The same and I'll just have to make sure that, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think and uh, the other option, I guess, for the commenting system, or the other thing that I thought about anyway, was uh, using, again, Google Sheets as the commenting system. And so it would push a comment back into a second sheet that was tied to, to each blog post and sort of keep um, effectively keep the comments in a CSV. Um, but Discuss was just easier. And the way that I'm passing the parameters, it worked really well. I was, I was shocked at how easy it was to turn on. Um, I had sort of set aside a, a week to figure that out, and it took about an hour. Um, so, so that was good. Uh, most, things, most things worked out better than I thought they would, really. So getting the CSS to, to play nice and getting it all to display well was, uh, was harder. But that was just me teaching myself as I went. So. I think, I mean, one of the exciting things, there's many things to discuss here, but like one of the things I think is really cool, just listening to you talk about it, reading the post, talking with it, with Tim about it, 
is that like it opens up all those questions like how would i do this how would i archive that how would i integrate third parties like you're asking some really cool questions to rethink some things for your faculty and students that is really kind of cool so like kudos on just some really creative thoughtful experimental ed tech i mean it's what i'm always most excited about when i see this stuff and your project was just you know i don't know i thought it was really like eye-opening like wow like why hasn't someone thought of this sooner it's really cool well a couple of things at least for me one of the things that i found interesting was looking at the sheet itself you know it exposes the data in different ways than than we normally see it i guess and it, that stuff's always there right if you're using wordpress you've got a sql database that's the same thing it's just not what we would normally see but i can see the the column that has all of the text for all of the blog posts and if I wanted to, I could just take that column and do data analysis on it and text mining, which is something that we don't normally do. But Adam Kroom actually wrote his master's thesis on sentiment analysis in student blog posts. And it's something that a psychology professor might be really into is, is yeah. you know, starting to dive into some of that data. And so I think, uh, you know, we need to be careful with the ethics on it. And we need to be careful with, with having students opt in uh, for that kind of study. But, um, but just having that sheet there and looking at it, I think, um, it doesn't open new possibilities. It just reminds us of the possibilities that are there in terms of, of doing, displaying the data in other ways other than a traditional blog. Well, you know, Reclaim Today, on behalf of me and Tim, just want to say to you, John, <laughs> you're a superstar <laughs> of the good work. Don't stop believing. Very cool. And before we go, we should give a quick shout out to Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> for uh, Pat Lockley, P. Goggy Web Stuff, sent us this amazing laser disc. Not that we need to make this a reclaim video episode. Maybe that'll be a separate Is this web thing. stuff? I just wonder, is a laser disc? I guess it came to us via eBay, so you it's kind of web stuff. Yeah, I think in customs, he actually had to <laughs> check it off as being web stuff. Um, but So he's our official yeah. sponsor for this episode. <laughs> there, there Thank you, you P. Goggy Web Stuff, for sponsoring go. John's unbelievably creative work. Uh, with Google Docs and or Google Sheets and Google Scripting That's right. and basically Google Sheets to blog at scale. Just right. loving it. Between that and the artwork from Michael Branson Smith running on the TV in the background here, yeah. it's a, it's a community effort all around, and and that's where it is. It gets right back to community, which oh. is the heart of EdTech. And if you want more on John's work, go to johnastewart.org. Mm -hmm. You can see this is only the first of a three part blog series. And I'm looking forward with bated breath to parts two and three, because part one, frankly, thumbs up. It blew me away. <laughs> Thanks. I hope to have part three out tomorrow if I can make time to write it. These are these are getting long. They're about 2,000 words each. And uh, and so it's a bit of a long series. But, but if you've got the time for it, hopefully part three will be out tomorrow. Well, thanks for documenting it, too. I mean, Absolutely. who said blogging is dead? Yeah. <laughs> so very cool. John, thanks for joining us. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.